Hi folks, this is Pastor Dave Grisham here with um, For God and Country Ministries. And you can find us on YouTube, For God and Country, David Grisham. And you can also find us on Facebook, For God and Country. Today, I wanted to talk about some of the myths that are surrounding Christianity. I have 14 points to go over, but this is too much for one video. So uh, we're going to divide this up into points one through seven today. And the title of this message is going to be called, If, the Biggest Little Word in the Bible. If, the Biggest Little Word in the Bible. If is a conditional word. Uh, if you do this, then God will do that. Or if you believe this, then this is what will happen. It is a conditional word, and it's very important in Scripture. And... Um, it can be used to dispel a lot of the myths that are surrounding Christianity and a lot of myths that even so-called Christians believe because they choose not to read their Bibles. You've got to actually read your Bible to know what the Bible says. You have to actually study the Bible to show yourself approved so that you can um, have the knowledge of God and you will not perish for lack of knowledge. So, let us get started in clearing up 14 myths about Christianity by using the word if, the biggest little word in the Bible. Now, if you want to contribute to our ministry today, you can contribute to uh, a cash app, and it's dollar sign for God and country Dave. Dollar sign for God and country Dave. Uh, we ask for donations only here. We don't ask for them on the streets. We ask for them here so that you might help us fund our ministry on the streets as we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the United States. So point number one, some myths about Christianity. Number one, the number one myth is Jesus is a friend of sinners. Jesus is not a friend of sinners. There is no scripture in the Bible that says Jesus is a friend of sinners. There's even a song, a, a Christian song out called Jesus, Friend of Sinners, and it just is not true. Jesus lays out in scripture the condition for friendship with him. Jesus is not a friend of sinners. He is a friend of saints. And here's what he says in John chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. He says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So the greatest love that you can do is to lay down your life for your friends, is to lay down your life for someone else, to give up your life to save the life of another. This is the greatest gift you can give because it, you're giving up basically everything. Uh, you know, you can give away your house, but not your car. You can give away your car, but not your land. You can give away your everything but your retirement. But if you give away your life, you're giving everything you have. Okay, this is what Jesus did. He gave up everything. He gave up his very life so that sinners might be saved. He gave up his life. But he says this in verse 14. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. If you do whatsoever I command you. You are only a friend of Christ if you do everything he commands you. And that excludes sinners. This is talking about people who are saved, people who are obedient to Christ. If you do everything he commands you, then you are not a sinner, you are a saint following Jesus Christ and he is Lord of your life. You have accepted his authority in your life and you are obeying his authority in your life. That makes him your friend. You are not a friend of Jesus if you are not obeying Jesus. If Jesus is not your Lord, he is not your friend, okay? That's myth number one. You must be an obedient servant of Christ. He must be Lord of your life before he can be your friend. He, he's not just a friend of sinners. He's a friend of saints. Number two, God forgives everyone. And for this one, we have to turn over to Matthew. Chapter 
chapter 15, or sorry, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Here we go. Verse 15. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So forgiveness for Christ of your sins against God are conditional. If you forgive men their trespasses if they repent, then if you repent of your sins against God, God will forgive your trespasses against him. You see, God wants you to have a like mindset of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ forgives those who repent of their sins against God. God wants you to forgive men who repent of their sins against you. If you are like-minded with Christ, then God will forgive your sins against him because you've forgiven the sins of men against you. This shows God that you are of a like mind with him. You are becoming more like Jesus Christ. If you do not forgive, if men repent of their sins, and we'll get to that on a later point, if you forgive men who have repented of their sins from against you, then, and only then, will Christ forgive your sins against him. So forgiveness is conditional. God does not forgive everyone. God forgives everyone who meets the condition, who meets the condition, that's it. Number three, we all sin every day. There's a lot of people that go around teaching this, that we all sin every day. So let's turn to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Second Peter chapter one, verses five through 10. And let's read those. Because you know, you're gonna have to, you can't just believe something because it sounds good to you or because it tickles your emotions. You can't just believe whatever you want to believe about Christianity. The standard for Christianity is set forth in the word of God. This is the standard. You know, you, you can't just decide to be an electrician or a plumber and just wire something up the way that you feel like wiring it up or plumbing something in the way you feel like plumbing it. Whatever's easiest for you, whatever's most convenient for you, whatever satisfies you at the moment because your plumbing won't work or your, electric, your electrical work will burn the house down. You've got to abide by certain standards by which you do these things. So your standard for Christianity is set forth in scripture. It's not set forth in your own mind. You don't get to decide what Christianity is. You don't get to decide for yourself what is right and wrong. Only God gets to do that and we must abide by his standards. So do we all sin every day? Well, let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1 verses five through 10. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge temperance and to temperance patience and to patience godliness and to godliness brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness charity, which means love in action. Now in verse eight, it says, for if these things be in you and abound, in other words, if you follow this process set forth right here, it's outlined, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, and to virtue, knowledge, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, 
and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity, or love, love in action. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful. In other words, you, if you do these things, you will produce fruit in your walk with God, nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. So if you don't follow this process, you're blind and you don't know where you're going and had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So this is talking to Christians. This is a specific process. It's talking to Christians, okay? Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if, if, there's that word if again, if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. So it is possible, another translation says you shall never stumble. So it is possible to not stumble and not sin. You don't have to fall. That means you don't have to walk in sin every day. If you walk in sin every day, it's because you're not following this process. If you're not following this process, you're not walking with God. That's what it says here. Because if you're if you're not following this process, you will be barren, you will be unfruitful. But if you do these things, you will not be barren and you will not be unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind. So if you believe you sin every day, it's because you're blind. You're blind and you don't know where you're going and you're stumbling into sin every day. And it's because you're not following this process. If you're not following this process, you're not walking with God, okay? You're walking in the ways of the world, okay? So if you follow this, if you do these things, you shall never fall. You can't, it is possible for you to never walk in sin if you follow this process. And the specifics of how you follow this process is also contained in other scriptures, which we don't have time to go into today. But my point in this particular point is that you don't have to sin every day. Sinning every day means you're blind and you're walking in the dark every day. That is not the life of a Christian. That is the life of a sinner, okay? Now, number four, we must always obey the government. We must always obey the government. There are some people that have decided that we must always obey the government and we must always obey when they tell us things like, uh, we have to wear a mask or we have to take the vaccine or we have to do these things um, all the time. No matter what the government says, we are commanded to obey the government. All governments and all men have restrictions on their authority. God has no limitations on his authority, but man's authority is always limited. Uh, as a husband, I have limited authority with my wife. As a father, I have limited authority with my children. If I were in the governing authorities, which I used to be in law enforcement, I would have limited authority over what I could do to people or tell people what to do because my authority is limited. What is the limitations of that authority? We'll turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 13, verse four. Uh, Romans chapter 13, verse four. It's at the top of the page here, okay. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. If you're a government official, you're a minister of God for good, not for evil, for good. That's the determining factor. Good by whose standards? The government standards? No, by God's standards. God determines what is good and evil. So the government is to 
implement things for good as defined by scripture, not by the government. The government doesn't get to set the standards for good or evil any more than I do, any more than you do. Only God and his word sets the standards for good and evil. And so the government must abide by those standards as well. For he is a minister of God to thee for good, not for evil. But if thou do that which is evil, so if you do that which is evil, not defined by the government, which the government has determined as evil, but what God has determined as evil, be afraid for he beareth not the sword in vain. So the government bears the sword, not in vain, but to enforce those things which are good and to punish those things which are evil as defined by God, not defined by government, not defined by Democrats or Republicans, not defined by you or me, but the, what is defined as good and evil by the word of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So if the government executes wrath on them that do good, the government has exceeded their authority and those that seek to do good as defined by God do not have to obey that authority because that authority has exceeded its limits. When the government exceeds the limits that God has placed upon it, Christians do not have to obey the government. So if the government, if you are given rights by God, as it is stated in the Constitution, you have God-given rights. If you have a God-given right to freedom of speech, you have the legal right from God to speak the truth as determined by God. You have that, that God-given right. The government has no authority to take it from you. And if the government tells you to shut up, you can tell the government to go jump in a lake and you can speak the truth and defy the government. This is the only time we're permitted to defy the government is when it, the government has exceeded its authority and goes against the word of God. When it starts to punish those who would do good and lets those go who would do evil. So if, if the devil's always trying to make evil good and good evil, and then the government buys into that, into the definition of good and evil by the devil rather than of God, then the government starts to become corrupt and starts to do evil things. That evil government, you are not required to obey. You are not required to do what that government says. But in the book of Acts, it says we ought to obey God rather than men. When the, the commandments of men when they seek to usurp the authority of God in scripture and try to get you to obey a man rather than God, you are always commanded, Christian, to obey God rather than men. So we are not always to obey the government. Just like a wife is not always commanded to obey her husband. Her husband can tell her to do certain things, but if he exceeds the authority of God, if he tells her to lie, if he tells her not to pray to God, if he tells her not to study the Bible, if he tells her not to teach the children the word of God, uh, she can defy that authority because she is commanded by God to do all those things. So a husband's authority is limited. All men's authority on this earth are limited. Uh, a father's authority on this earth is limited and the government's authority on this earth is limited. And it is set forth in this verse in Romans chapter 13 that they are there, the government exists to punish those who do evil and to protect those who do good. If they flip that around, then you no longer have to obey the government. So we do not have to always obey the government. Point number five, we must somehow keep the dietary laws and or feast days, etc., of the Jews. That's Old Testament stuff, and we are not commanded to obey that. So let's turn over to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Got to find it in here. 
Colossians chapter 2, verses 20 to 23. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why, as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances? If you're dead with Christ, or if, if you're dead with Christ, that is, if you're saved and you have died to the things of the world, why, as through living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a shoe of wisdom in will worship and humility and negligent neglecting of the body, not in any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. So what he's saying here is that if you are dead to Christ and you are alive in God's word, then don't worry about the shadow of things. Worry about the substance of things which is in Christ, as is mentioned in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16 and 17, where it says that these are all shadows of things, but the substance is of Christ. So you are not obligated to operate in the shadow of things, but you are to operate in the substance of Christ and not in the shadow of things, of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was a shadow of Christ. It was pointing to Christ. But once you come to Christ, you are not required to fulfill these ritualistic things that pointed to Christ, but you are to live in Christ himself and do the things and be obedient directly to Christ and don't be obedient to the shadows of things. That's what he's trying to say there, okay? So you do not have to keep the dietary laws. That means you can eat pork, you can eat these things, you can eat shellfish. You don't have to obey those things, which were an abomination to the Jews and they were there for diet. Now, if you want to do this to maintain a better physical, you know, uh, uh, health and all of that, that's fine. But you can't go around saying people are going to go to hell if they eat pork, if they eat bacon. That is not, that is not salvation pending okay keeping the feast days if you want to keep the feast days you can keep the feast days what you cannot do is command that others do it and make it salvation pending because the scripture says it's not salvation pending so as i said the standard of christianity is set forth in scripture it's not set forth by you and your opinions okay it's not set forth by you and your opinions Number six, God always answers prayers. Does God always answer prayers? Well, let's turn to John chapter 14 and find out. John chapter 14. We're going to look at verses 12 through 14. All right. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that I will do, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Well, that sort of sounds like he's going to answer everything. But you got to remember in verse 12, he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, he shall also, and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father. You have to remember that that's in the context of verse 12, which means works. If you're doing the works of God and you're keeping the will of God, then of course you're gonna ask in his name and he's going to do it because God always provides 
for those that are doing his will in the world. Um, for instance, if a man has a construction crew and they've got shovels and they're digging a ditch, he provides the shovel so they can dig the ditch because they're doing the work. He's not going to give a shovel to some guy on the street just so he can take it home and do work for himself. His job is to provide a shovel for his work crew who's doing work for him. God has a job for you to do. He has works for you to do. And we're not talking about works-based salvation. We're talking about salvation-based works. We're talking about works that God has set aside for us to do after we are saved, that we should walk in them, as Scripture says. And so he's going to answer your prayers and make provision for you if you're doing the things that he's commanded you to do if you're doing his works. So in the context of the works that you're doing, the greater works that you're doing, then he's gonna provide for you if you ask for something in his name. If you need a shovel, he's going to give you a shovel. If you need something to do his work, he's gonna give it to you because you need it. He wants the work done, you're doing it, he's going to provide it. But God does not answer your prayer just because you want something. Just because you want it doesn't mean you get it, okay? God's not going to bless you with a new car unless you're going to use the car to travel all over the country and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want a new car because you just like driving a new car, God has no reason to answer your prayer. You don't deserve a new car just because you want one. You might deserve a car because you're using it to do God's work, okay? So God does not answer all prayers. Most people, a lot of people, ask prayers selfishly. They're asking for things they can spend it on their pleasures rather than doing the things of God. And God's not necessarily going to answer those prayers. As a matter of fact, he doesn't. He does not answer those prayers. All right, number seven. Obedience is works-based salvation. There's a lot of people going around today saying that obedience is works-based salvation, but that is not true, okay? It is not true. Obedience is salvation-based works. To obey God is the evidence that you believe God. If I believed that my car was going to break down, I would go do work on my car to prevent it from breaking down. You don't work on your car every day because you don't believe it's gonna break down every day. But if you hear a funny noise, if you notice a wobble, if you notice something going wrong with your car, then you're gonna examine it. And if you believe that there's something wrong with it, then you're going to work on it. You're going to do works based upon that belief. If you're not working on your car, it's because you don't believe it's going to break down. Okay? So in John chapter 14, verse 15 through 18, Jesus says this, If ye love me, keep my commandments. He's saying... If you love him, you will keep his commandments. You will obey him if you love him. That's what he's saying, okay? And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now, why is he sending you the Holy Spirit? To enable you to keep the commandments. That's why and to comfort you when you have to face the world who will come against you because you are obeying his commandments. You see, you're either going to be an enemy of God and a friend of the world, as scripture says, or you're going to be a friend of God and an enemy of the world. You, you're going to have enemies no matter what. Either God is your enemy because the world is your friend or the world is your enemy because God is your friend and you're doing everything that Jesus is commanding you. So that when you keep his commandments, 
he will send the comforter to comfort you in those in that persecution because because the bible says that all that you know seek to, to obey god will suffer persecution and so he's telling you here that he will send you a comforter even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive the world cannot receive the spirit of truth because the world does not obey god they don't receive the spirit of truth because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And he says here, and at that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him, and he will manifest and will manifest myself to him. And then Jesus says in verse 23, if a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So he's saying, if you love Christ, you will keep his word. You will obey him. And if you don't love him, you won't obey him. That word if is really big in that scripture. It's very conditional, and it's very clear. If you don't keep the commandments of Christ, you don't love Christ. It doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you claim you believe. I don't care if you go to church six days a week. If you don't obey the commandments of Christ, you don't love Christ. It's just that simple. If you do love Christ, you will keep his commandments. Obedience is a necessary component of salvation. It is the evidence of your salvation. Obedience is the fruit of faith. If you, have, if you have no obedience to God, you have no faith in God. Your level of faith in God is directly proportional to your level of obedience to God. And you will not demonstrate any level of faith by being disobedient to God. Matter of fact, you reflect your unbelief when you disobey God. If you disobey God and you sin every day, all right, let's also turn over to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. And we are going to go to verse 17. Matthew 19, 17. He's telling, well, let's go to 16. Let's back up a little bit. And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he's asking him, What can I do to have eternal life? He understands that there's a level of obedience required because this is a reflection of your faith. So then Jesus says to him, and he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. So in other words, if you're referring to me as a man, well, men are not good. But if you're referring to me as God, see, he's trying to get him to understand that if you think I'm good, then you understand who I am. But if thou wilt enter life, keep the commandments. If you want to enter into life, you must keep the commandments. Keep the commandments of God. You must obey God. And no one that disobeys God is ever going to go to heaven. You're not going to go to heaven if you don't obey God. Now, you can try to interpret that as works-based salvation, but it's really not. Because if you're truly born again, you're a new creature, a new creation, if you're born again, you will be a new creature, a new creation, and that new creature, that new creation will obey God. Because the old creation, the old person died, 
with Christ, died to sin, and you're born again in righteousness. If you're not born again in righteousness, you're not saved. The person that is saved will obey God. That will be their new divine nature. They, you'll become a partaker of the divine nature, as it says in Scripture. And he saith unto him, which? Jesus said, thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So he's saying, this will be reflected in how you live. If you do these things, it will be reflected in how you live. And the young man said unto him, all these things I've kept from my youth. What lack I yet? In other words, is there anything that I lack? And Jesus went after the one thing in his life that became, was an idol, that he, this young man was an idolater. You can keep all these other commandments, but if there is anything in your life that's more important than God, um, you're not gonna make it because you will always serve that thing above God. And what is that one thing with this young man? If thou wilt be perfect, oops, you can be perfect. Uh, well, not absolutely perfect. The minute you sin the first time, you blew perfection out of the water. But he means perfect in, in terms of mature in your obedience. Go and sell that thou hast and give it to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. He told him to get rid of all his material possessions and give it to the poor and then come and follow him. And the young man wouldn't do it. He walked away sad. That young man is going to go to hell if he doesn't do what Jesus said. He doesn't love Jesus. He just got through saying in verses just right before that, if you keep this all in context, he just got through saying that if you do what I say, then you love me. And if you don't do what I say, you don't love me. He just showed right there that he doesn't love Jesus. So you must accept the son to receive the father. You must accept the son to receive the father. You must obey the son to obey the father. You must follow the son to get to the father. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the father but by me, John 14, 6. You must follow the son. He was telling this young man here, yes, you fulfilled all the things of the old covenant, but you must now follow me. You must follow whatever I tell you to do. And I'm telling you to sell everything that you have and come and follow me. Show that you're willing to get rid of all your worldly things. You're willing to get rid of all this worldly stuff. Show me that, that there is nothing in this world that is more valuable than me. If you truly want to follow God, God will be more valuable to you than anything. Be more valuable to you than your house, your cars, your wife, your children, your grandchildren, your own life itself. Jesus was faithful to the Father unto death. You need to be faithful to Christ unto death. If you're willing to do that, then you can be a disciple of Christ. If you're not willing to do that, then you don't, you don't deserve to be his disciple and you will not go to heaven. The word if is a very big word in the Bible. So we're gonna conclude this part one for now. So this video is not too long and um, we're gonna take up again tomorrow. I'll put up, post up another video tomorrow on part two of if, the biggest little word in the Bible. God bless you all.